So here we are. This is class. You might be able to see some of them in the background behind me. Uh, you're projected up on a screen. That's why I'm looking at the screen as opposed to uh, into camera. Okay. <laughs> Am I scary, kind of? No, you're not. You're great. You look fine. Okay. So this is Mr. Paul Weber. He's a casting director. He worked at 20th. He's independent. He has his own business. He's cast uh, multiple TV shows and feature films. He runs uh, workshops and educational opportunities in Los Angeles and around the world, around the country. Um, he's come into Milwaukee uh, a couple years ago uh, for me and uh, uh, all around good guy. So... Um, the class is comprised of sophomore to senior filmmakers. They are director, producer, writer, cinematographer, editor, candidates, some wear multiple hats. And uh, of course, one of the reasons why we wanted to have you on, Paul, was so that you could help them in uh, working with actors, casting, the reason why you would want a casting director, uh, as we talked about yesterday, uh, the difference between doing it yourself and, and working with a professional such as yourself um, and, and anything else. They may have questions and, and uh, I think we're good and we can just all get going. Okay, good. Um, hi guys, uh, how do you want to do this? Does, does everyone, I mean, is, does everyone have sort of an idea of, of what a casting director does? For the most part. Um, what our role is in the process? Um, anyone want to throw out an idea or a, a thought as to what your perception of what casting might do? R Ryan, this is Ryan. You can't see him, but he'll ask a question. Uh, okay. I mean, I guess uh, my assumption would be that you're most of your role would be to kind of uh, guide the director through the process of picking through like the thousand people that audition for uh, any given part? Uh, you know, that's actually incredibly accurate. Um, <laughs> especially for independent filmmakers or, or um, uh, and as you know, in television, it's a little bit different because uh, there tend to be a lot more people involved in the process in television. And if you guys are, let's say you're a director in television, you're brought that you're brought into the process quite late. You're brought in after most of the work has been done. You're brought in just to shepherd the the episode or the the TV movie through. For the most part, um, in independent films, you're brought in really just for sometimes the last part of casting, uh, the callbacks of casting for television. Um, when you guys are doing independent movies, which it seems as if many of you are looking to cut your teeth in either new media first or small budget independent films, which is how most of the filmmakers that, that I know get their starts on, um, it's a much earlier process because you guys typically write uh, and direct your own projects. Um, and sometimes you even edit your own projects. And you're pretty prolific the way you have to become multi-hyphenates in the business because, uh, because of budgets and because you are skilled at it or, or getting um, uh, learning how to do that and, and want to be in more in control of your own project, which is really the beauty of independent filmmaking. But you would probably, if you could um, afford a small budget for casting, and I say small because we get it, that when you guys are working on a small budget movie, you know, there isn't much money for cast or casting directors. But um, I, for one, having come from a studio culture, working with big budget projects, um, I'm enjoying, for the most part, the process <laughs> of working with um, emerging filmmakers and trying to help them out as, as much as possible. Um, so you guys, you're right. We do have to go through a lot of... Um, Oh, you know, it's it's we have to find that needle in the haystack. And the only thing that I caution you guys with is occasionally you'll say, and you've done this and you will do this, you know, we really can't afford a casting director. Why don't we just do it ourselves? And you can do that. And then you will see how hellish the job of a casting director <laughs> is because it's just really time consuming. It's not... You're, de you're dealing with human beings and you're dealing with, you know, time management and you're dealing with trying to get the best performance that you can of an actor in the room 
And it takes a lot of time, and it's tough on you guys when you're trying to budget, write, uh, uh, line produce, and and actually shoot your movie uh, without dealing with cast. Um, so that's our job, and it, it becomes um, uh, we become your 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 confidant, your consigliere, you know, your right hand man when it comes to. Um, trying to be in sync with creatively what you're looking for and, and also try to open your eyes as much as possible to as many ways of casting a, a role as possible because I've seen director writers uh, change their minds when they see an actor in the room that they didn't expect, didn't fit their exact visual image, let's say, of a role, but an actor brought something special to the role that, that, um, that made them look at it a different way and many times improve the, the film and the project because of that actor. And that's what we're trained to do, and that's what we try to do is, is, is surprise you with talent that you might not have otherwise been exposed to. How's that for, <laughs> for one breath at 7 in the morning? Excellent, excellent. So if people have questions, feel free to ask questions as well. I mean, that would be a good thing. Um, apart from, I mean, another, when you say that there's the, an inordinate amount of work, it's not just the seeing of the people and scheduling that and, and then scheduling the discussions with the people who will make the decisions, but it's also contracts and the paperwork and the other things that, that you would have experience in that most of us would not have, you know, unless you're producing, I mean, producers may indirect, you know, but Starting out, you don't have the experience of negotiating contracts or even understanding what the contracts are. Right. And, and casting um, typically would only go so far down that road. Right. We, would, we would negotiate the deals based on what the producer and I discuss as far as what the, the available monies are. I mean, you guys, if you, unless there are any producing students in there, you guys are more on the creative end and typically stay on that end because producing takes a whole different kind of mindset. Um, and they're so necessary. The, you know, the financials we could get into um, uh, when you might hire a casting director and what you will need to have in place with your producer before you even hire a casting director. And we should discuss that because they, they, this is a film business class and these are producers and directors and you know, hyphenates that are, are wearing different hats. But some want to produce and others want to direct. I believe I've represented that correctly, but if I misspoke. Hi, Alex. So, um, yes, I mean, that, that, that's uh, open for um, conversation. Well, good, because there seems to be a lot of um, smaller budget independent projects popping up. And I get probably three to five phone calls or emails from filmmakers a day to ask if I'm interested in working on their movie. Now, and, and they always tend to be on the smaller budget side. Um, uh, the bigger budget movies, I have to chase. You know, because that's, they're the ones that pay more. They're the ones that are usually more high profile because, because they have... Um, uh, well-known directors, or they're represented by a studio, or they're in the five-plus million dollar range, then you have to go look for those, and you are grateful, or they're television projects that are financed. See, that's the thing, guys. Um, uh, those movies uh, are easier, and television is easier, because you have a network, or you have a studio, you have financing, you have creative elements that are known already attached to the project. So when I start dealing with agents and managers, it's easier. I can just say, hey, I'm working on a um, Ryan Murphy project, you know, or I'm working on an Aaron Sorkin project. And immediately you've got, you know, bees to honey coming from all agents and managers who want their clients in that project and high-level actors. When you're dealing with small budget or no budget, you know, uh, independent films or new media projects, it's the opposite. They, um, they flee. You know, talent, agents, 
they want nothing to do with the project. It's not good business, literally. It's no business for them. Um, uh, when their jobs depend upon churning commissions on their clients and putting their clients in as high a profile projects as possible. So you really, you know, it's an uphill battle for no money for anybody. You know, so for uh, uh, an established casting director uh, who's earned the right after a while to call themselves established to even get involved in a small budget movie, you um, you have to have certain elements in place. You know, let's say your guys are doing, uh, and this may sound like a lot of money, but it isn't, but it is. Like, let's say half a million dollars, $500,000 for an independent film, which is what I'm helping uh, in North, in South Dakota filmmakers on. It's, not, it's a lot of money to carry in your pocket, but not a lot of money to make a movie. No, it isn't, because it, 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 it uh, bleeds out pretty quick, which is why you need a good producer to sort of to, to work your budgets. Um, and you want to do it union, which you can do it these days, because all you have to do is pay an actor 100 bucks a day to be in a union project, and you get a union actor, which is pretty damn good. Yeah. Uh, you do have to pay pension and health fair, health you know, fringes and all that, and that bumps things up a bit. But the quality of actor you get by getting a, a union actor is typically much better. And the union has made it easier to pay 100 bucks a day to get. Well, and, and uh, it, it, it may differ, but from my understanding or from when I look at my paychecks, if I work for hundred dollars a day, the the pension and welfare and the, the bump on that is anywhere from seventeen to maybe forty. I mean, it's it's still under two hundred dollars a day to, to work with talent. It is. I mean, it's well worth it, I think. And the unions have been very flexible about that, especially as budgets have come down and the cost of production has come down. You know, to afford to be able to uh, get higher talent, better quality filmmaking, better equipment for less money. Right. Um, so, but but. You guys need to make sure you have a budget, and you need to be able to set. Um, you okay? Am I am I boring you? Right. No, I'm checking on the students. They're behind me. Okay. I can't. I can't. Looking at you, I can't see them. Um, with the. Um, Sorry. With a budget, um, you've got to have a budget in place, and for for a casting director typically to get involved, and I took a film finance class, and, and I just met with him two days ago on a project that he brought me into with the filmmakers because he was ready to bring me into it. Because he assured me that, he said, Paul, I'm not calling you on this project until I've been paid, he's the film financier, uh, to start putting elements together and start raising financing. He said, I don't call you unless I have assurance that 25% of their budget is in escrow in the bank already, that they've hired a lawyer and set up an LLC, okay? And uh, he says, I don't even care that the script is any good. I don't even read the script. That'll be your job and see if what notes you want to give to the filmmaker about the quality of the script in terms of attraction to actors, okay? So let's say you're doing a $500,000 movie for me to get involved you would need a quarter of that, $125,000 in escrow. For, to get a call from a filmmaker who's never done anything, who's written his first script. By the way, the script used to be worth, anybody who's written a script used to be worth $8, which is the cost of printing a script. That's the, that's the value of your script by <coughs> to a financier. Uh, now it's zero because you can write it, and you can PDF it, and you can send it. So it's not worth the paper it's not written on, basically, <laughs> right? So that's what we look at, you know, that's what a financier would look at. So I don't, everyone's written a script in Hollywood, you know. Um, what, what I'm interested in, where's the money to produce it? Who's, invest, who's investing in it? Um, how much? Um, uh, then I get involved. And then I'll read it. And then I'll read it and I'll go, this is not a very good script. And I don't think I can sell this. I won't tell that to the writer or director, but I'll tell it to the financier. And I'll say, I'm just, I'm, I'm not interested in taking on this movie. They're too hard to do. But if I love the script, I talk to the director and the writer, smart, creative, up and comer. Maybe he's done a short that went to one of the festivals 
you know, that's a good entree. That helps me sell the project to an agent or a manager who's representing talent that they're very cautious about putting in a little movie, right? Because again, there's no upside for them unless it's a great part and an up-and-coming filmmaker. Otherwise, it's just noise. They'd rather put their people in an episode of Scandal, you know, where they can make 10 grand for the week and be in a hit show that's on TV and people are going to see them. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So it doesn't mean you can't find a casting person to help you. But I would, pr I would probably suggest that if you're in Wisconsin and you're making a, um, you're making a, a small budget movie that you, that there's probably someone involved in casting in the area, right? Who can help you, um, uh, yeah, an associate, an assistant, even a casting director who will help take on your project and help shepherd it. But you're going to call an LA casting director if you want a name or two in the project. So all, a couple of the movies that I'm working on that are shooting in South Dakota and, um, and Florida um, and Mississippi, they don't want me to cast the whole movie. They just want me to f try to find a couple of nice names who will work for the money in their project. And that's when I get the phone calls. But for me, I need to make sure that at least you guys are set up as a real company, that when I call an agent and they say, are you guys financed? I can say, we have most of our financing in place. And I stretch the truth a little there. I say, we have most of it in place. I just need to lock down... Um, uh, Aaron Paul, let's say, you know, from Breaking Bad. I need to, uh, I need to offer the role to him, and if I can get Aaron Paul attached to this project, I will be assured the rest of the money and we can pay him, right? And to for insurance, uh, I'm going to offer him fifty thousand dollars for out of our five hundred thousand dollar budget for three days' work. And I'm going to give you $15,000 right now in escrow that if we don't, uh, if we don't move forward on the movie and he wants to do it, he gets the $15,000 or You're you guys get it, right? So that's what you got to be willing to do. Otherwise, um, you're not playing in, in the, in the big leagues as far as, um, attracting LA-based talent. Does that make sense, guys? Yes. Um, and you should have that. You should be so lucky to have that problem at a certain point. Really? But that's what you want to aspire to, and, and, and it's what filmmakers don't seem to understand because they, they get so involved in their script, and they get so, they're so passionate about it, which is what attracts me to them because of their passion. Um, and they think everyone would want to do their project. So they call me, and they're 24 years old, and they just got out of film school, let's say, and they have a wish list you know, for their $300,000 first movie, and they have no money. And you know, names on it are you know, uh, you know, people like um, uh, Chris Helmsworth and, you know, and uh, oh, just to name any, almost any A-list actor those are the people they ask me, can I make phone calls about? I mean, that's how naive they are about the, the, the project and how sort of myopic they are in terms of, 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 of how they, under, their understanding of the process. So that's when, when we talk, like I go to, to South by Southwest, which you guys, have, um, for those of you who don't know, is a big film festival in Austin, film, music, and interactive festival. So I'm on a casting panel on Saturday, and it'll be this conversation with a lot of uh, filmmakers, young filmmakers, who are going to be talking to casting directors about our process and um, what we need to get involved um, on your project. And the smarter you guys are earlier on when you come to talk to us, um, then it's more than just us holding your hands and changing diapers, you know, as far as education. It's, oh, Great, I'll read your script. Uh, um, if you guys assure me that you have some money, you're set up as a company, as an LLC, you've actually hired maybe a production lawyer that can start forming you know, the company itself that's going to make the movie, I'll look at the script and then we'll take it from there. 
Yes. That is fantastic. Any questions based on what Paul has said so far? Are you encouraged or discouraged at this point? <laughs> encouraged. Good. We I, have a, I have a question. Okay. Or did you, did someone have a question before me? Um, we'll go ahead. And then I think Stephen had a question, and you said you were encouraged. Anyone discouraged? I mean, it's easy to be discouraged, so there's nothing wrong with it. You just know that uh, when things are discouraging, you, you find a way to move through them. You know, you gotta, can't be discouraged if you're in a pond <laughs> fighting yeah. for your and life. It's, it's, you gotta, education is, you know, it's hard making movies, but it's yeah. at the same time, it's easier than ever to get your project out there. And, and you can make, in fact, these, a couple of these guys that just contacted me that I'm helping get a, a name attached to, it's in the horror genre. And so it's, I happen to know some of those actors, so I actually made an offer to an actor. Um, their movie is um, under $100,000, hmm. and they've shot it. And now they're just looking to shoot the scenes with the actor right. um, that will help them a little bit in terms of selling the movie. That's an interesting way to do the movie as well, too. It's um, The movie looks pretty good for... Um, I think about $65,000 they, they shot it for, the entire movie. Um, so um, anyway, the, and the point of that is there are lots of different ways of, of getting a movie made, and, and movies are now being made for a budget that um, you can raise money through all sorts of means, through Kickstarter, through, through family, through friends, you know, uh, a lot of young filmmakers I know are getting their movies made for um, a really tight budget, and it's giving them an opportunity to showcase their um, their skills as a filmmaker, a writer, a director. And that was never... When I was starting out, uh, uh, filmmakers were making shorts on film, 35 millimeter film. And it was costing them for a short sixty-five, seventy-five thousand dollars. It looked beautiful, you know, but that was the technology right. at the time. Now you can do something, you know, for a fraction of that, or do a whole webisode series for ten thousand dollars or less. That's awesome. Uh, before you ask your question, I, just, I wanted to to, to follow up. Um, so. When it comes to advising young filmmakers, say they say, I want Chris Helmsworth, you're not going to get him, for example. But who's hot? Who, you know, and I'm not asking you to name current hot stars for them, but I'm saying uh, when it comes to uh, putting together a cast, what are the considerations you have for distribution domestically and, and, and foreign in terms of who you can sell a picture, who can open a picture, who can be on the cover of a DVD, or if, if there were such a thing anymore. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. Well, that's, um, uh, that's always changing. Mm -hmm. But all of you guys, now everyone thinks that, you know, they, they know how to cast because they can get IMDb Pro and look at the star meter. <laughs> right. You know? and, and that's somewhat accurate, and then it's oftentimes not accurate. It tends to be relatively accurate when it comes to the top actors out there. Now, there are only a handful of actors, male actors, um, five, ten actors who mean much internationally. Um, everyone wants them, okay? And they're not going to do your movie, let's face it. They're mostly going to do the bigger budget uh, studio picture that are safe for them, for the most part, to do, that their agents want them to do. Uh, once in a while, you get someone like Matthew McConaughey, who, who did the movie Dallas Buyers Club that he won the, uh, the uh, Oscar for. Uh, he was in direct conflict with his, with his agents at CAA. Of course, do you think they wanted him to do that movie? What do you think? No. No. Absolutely not. You're gonna what? You're gonna lose weight? You look so good walking on the beach in your bathing suit. That's you're on People magazine covers every week. That's exactly what he didn't want to do anymore. He didn't want to do the light romantic comedies, and his star was starting to sink a bit too. Because all he was getting known for are those kinds of projects and looking good 
uh, in his uh, in his surf shorts, right on the beach. And I remember thinking that I went, "Get off the beach, man! Mm-hmm. You have to, because you're not being taken seriously as an actor anymore." And um, and he said, "Listen, I'm, I'm going to do this movie with this relatively new filmmaker about this subject that no one's going to be interested in, possibly." Um, and I'm going to lose a lot of weight and I'm not going to be the same kind of visual marketing icon as I had been in the past. I want you guys to get on board with me. <laughs> so of course, and it's for no money. Uh, so of course they tried to talk him out of it and he just said, listen, I'm not going to be available for any other projects because I'm going to lose weight and I'm going to do this movie. So of course they had to get behind him. But that's when you have an actor telling his agent that this is what I'm going to do. Usually it's the other way around, where an agent will sit down with an actor and say, uh, uh, these are the projects we need, would like you to consider. Um, and even though I may have an offer in for Matthew McConaughey for a $2 million movie, that offer won't even be presented. Legally, they're supposed to, but he'll never even hear about that movie from his agent. Which is why what makes us a little squirrely sometimes, because I'll go around the agent and I'll go to the manager, let's say. Or I may even go to Matthew McConaughey himself if I find a route out to him and can pitch the project um, in a way that, because I'm passionate about it, or I'm passionate about this filmmaker. Just like I have a feeling for Matthew, for uh, Dallas Buyers Club, that the initial conversation didn't happen through the agent. The initial conversation probably happened through a personal connection with him. Um, so uh, we got off point a little bit, but the reality is there are only a handful of male stars that will mean very much um, uh, internationally, and there are even fewer female actors <coughs> who will mean much internationally. And everyone wants them. So you have to get more creative and, and, and uh, bring down your budgets and realize you may not get foreign distribution on your projects. Um, it may be just a domestic project, but you can sell it on many, many different platforms. Um, the financier that I told you about who brings me in when things are ready, he's already taken a $100,000 movie that I did not get involved in at the time, and he's already sold it to Netflix, uh, Hulu, Amazon, Plus, um, uh, uh, some video VOD platforms, and he's already pre-sold it. Nobody's really in the movie, but he sent the movie to all of these outlets, and they liked it enough to buy it. So he's probably more than covered his costs, the hundred thousand dollar budget, and now they're back with a one point eight million dollar budget movie. The same filmmakers, same director, same writer. And that's the one I have a meeting on, is for 1.8, I can get it involved, especially now that they have a third of that money set aside. Um, in escrow, and the money came from the same investors who financed the first movie, because they see that it's working. They're taking a little more risk, much more risk now on a 1.8, as opposed to a $100,000 movie, but they see the, the model is working for them. And, the sales outlets are working. Now they need a much higher level name or three recognizable names. Like, you guys know who Rain Wilson is? Mm. Yeah, Rain Wilson. So I love his name. Up. You know, he would be great for one of these parts. Um, and then I need two names of equal or better name of value, recognition value. Even for a $1.8 million movie, that's, these days, that's a really good budget. For, for a movie uh, that's an independent movie. Um, so that's how we have to uh, approach this based on, and we can't get these actors. I, it's still gonna be a sell for me. Because it's his second movie, this director writer. His first movie was a $100,000 movie. But at least we can show that to the agent. We can show it to the actor. We can set a meeting and an actor can take a, a bit of a chance if the role is interesting enough and he, trusts creatively what the director is doing, the filmmaker is doing, and come on board. Because movies like that are made all the time. You know, you see movies and you kind of go, wow, how did that get made? Mm -hmm. And it's usually because of the persistence of the casting director or the filmmaker's vision and passion. 
and getting them in the room together and finessing that and then finally getting your movie made. So it's a process, you know, but it's, um, it's, it's a worthy one when it pays off like that. I really appreciate that. That's, I mean, it's an excellent nuts and bolts description of, of how people can move forward in their career and where they start and, and how they advance and how bigger things can happen for them as they, as they continue to pursue. Uh, Alex had a question, and Stephen had a question, Ryan has a question. So, uh, Alex? Uh, yeah, my question is, um, uh, the um, the process of like um, bringing like, a big name actor into like um, a fairly like smaller budget movie, like say, you know, 500,000 um, 500, to get, say, for example, Aaron Paul into like you know, the film, would that be considered what they call paying um, the actor for scale for part of the Screen, screen Actors Guild? Um... Did you say, would you pay that actor's scale? Is that what you, you asked? The, the, the way you, you talked, the, the example you, t the, the example you gave about like, um, the, getting like, you know, well, a fairly well-known actor for like a $50,000 budget, is that, is that what's considered paying for scale? Oh, no, $50,000 would not be scale. Yeah, you, is that what the question is? Are you saying the budget is $50,000 or the budget for the actor? Oh, no, wait, sorry, it was like a $500,000 movie, you pay $50,000 for him to shoot. For three to, days. For three days. That wouldn't be considered for scale, would it? No, no, scale is, um, on a, scale is a sliding scale, a union sliding scale. Okay. If it's, if it's an uh, ultra low budget, under $200,000 is, I think, an under low, is a uh, ultra low budget, where you can pay $100 a day to an actor, $100 would be considered scale. Mm. You know, if it's higher budget movies, then fifteen, sixteen hundred dollars a week is considered scale. Does that make sense, guys? So it really depends on the the level of the budget of the project. Then the union raises the scale of uh, the weekly or the daily amount. Okay. And I think when Paul mentioned that they would offer fifty thousand dollars, that's because. Aaron Paul isn't going to work for scale, most likely, and he's going to want something that makes it worth his while, and, and maybe $50,000 gives you that at least talking. Thing. Yeah, it at least makes it real. But you also, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you up, but you also had made it a pay or play of, of you would give him 15. Not a pay or play. Well, no, but, I mean, but, you, but you said he would walk with 15000 if it didn't happen. Yeah, I would, I would suggest to the producer, I said, uh, you have to let the agent know this is real, and it's real money. It's not, oh, uh, yeah, we think we have it, or they need to know it's verified in an, in an escrow account. 50000 is there. 50, 15 of it is walk-away money if we don't get the movie made in time. I just did that with a movie. Um, we offered the actor $100,000 for the picture, and uh, the, he did one day... Uh, one day of filming, and then the union shut it down in Puerto Rico, the IATSE, which is the New York Union. They didn't have their paperwork complete, so the union came in and just shut it down. That actor walked away with $25,000 just for starting the project, and now they're rebooting again, and we have to renegotiate his deal, but his agent would have never let him go unless $25,000 was already in his pocket on behalf of the actor. Excellent. While while we're on that point, why why don't you just briefly describe pay or play? Uh, pay or play is is uh, uh, I don't suggest it ever be done. <laughs> right. Uh, anything. Right. Um, because uh, pay or play is uh, we're offering the, uh, Aaron Paul fifty thousand dollars, and if he does it great, we pay him. Uh, you know, he plays, and we pay him. Um, if he if uh, for any reason, not he falls out or changes his mind, which they can do, but our production gets delayed. And the terms of the agreement is we are starting to shoot anywhere between March 3rd, 2015, and March 31st, 2015. Those are the terms of the contract for him. If that gets delayed, let's say, into mid-April, and it's a pay or play within that time frame, we lose the money. So of course you're not going to do that, because anything can happen. 
So what you do is you sort of meet them halfway and say, listen, you know this is an independent movie. <laughs> Aaron Paul's attached. Thank you very much. He loves it. We're going to be able, we think we're going to move forward on this within, you know, a month. Um, and, but if we don't uh, move forward within this time frame, um, he can consider himself free and, uh, and at liberty to do another project. And we will give him a $15,000 walk away uh, uh, fee uh, to, because we, we had to push or it didn't quite work out or the movie fell apart because the rest of the financing didn't come through. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, how about briefly uh, favored nations? Uh, favored nations uh, is a term that, uh, that we use when we're negotiating where all actors are treated the same in the same favored status in terms of getting paid the exact same. So if we're paying Aaron Paul $50,000, and then we want, um, let's say, uh, Catherine Heigl or someone to play the female lead, um, we will pay her $50,000 too. Say so it's favored nations. Everyone's getting the same. No one's getting better. That's generally how movies like The Avengers get made, correct? Uh, he has. He said, "Is that generally how movies like The Avengers get made?" Were you um, yes and no, because Avengers. I don't know for sure, but not everyone has the same work schedule. So let's say, you know, it's favorite nations. No one's getting more, but Catherine Heigl, we need for a week. Aaron Paul, we need three days. You know, so then they'll say, "Well, how long is she working for?" How long is Aaron Paul working for? Three days. Well, you need Catherine Heigl for a week, so you need to compensate her accordingly for that. So then, we, you know, we run sometimes into a little bit of problem on the on the time invested in that as well too. But but for many projects, especially when they're lower budget, we try to do as much favored nations as we can, so that we you know it becomes egalitarian that way. It becomes very. You know, it's like everyone's getting, we're all, no one's getting a lot of money, guys. You know, our names are all getting the same amount of money. So let's just, you know, let's build a barn and put on a play. Let's do this. You know what I mean? So um, there are lots of ways, though. That's part of what casting directors help you on is being artful about the way we help you put deals together for you producing uh, students. Um, we will suggest strategies on how to deal with agents and how to make your money and save you money in the in the casting process. Um, and I'll tell you this a little bit off the record, but you know I've worked on projects where if I can negotiate a better deal, I am given a bonus. As, so if they can't afford my regular fee as a casting director, Sometimes I ask for producer credit or associate producer credit, and or I um, I will uh, build in a bonus if I come in under my casting budget. So it, it incentivizes me to try to make as lean a deal as possible with the agents. Now I, I don't like screwing actors out of money. I used to be an actor, and I you know I I I wouldn't have appreciated appreciated that if if maybe the casting director's income was contingent upon him negotiating a, a tighter deal on that afterwards. But um, again, there are lots of ways to make, um, uh, there are lots of ways to negotiate deals and incentivize everybody. Very cool, very cool. Um, Stephen had a question? Steven. Yes, hello, my name's Stephen. Um, I was um, looking on your um, paulwebbercasting.com on your website. Yeah, you can't believe everything you read on that. <laughs> well, you had talked about how not to get an agent. Um, how not to get an agent. Yeah, and then what are the surefire, surefire ways oh. ever to get one? Well, what are the things to do in order to get an agent, and who needs an agent? Good, good question. Um, uh, every actor thinks, hey, why don't you want to represent me? I'm like, I'm cute. <laughs> um, so uh, an agent needs to feel like A is if you are a good agent 
or any agent, really, who's in business to, to, to make money, looks at you as if you're a commodity. You know, they need to feel that you can make them money. So you need to be someone who is, if not trained out of a, a school that's of some reputation, or at least a, a, an MFA or a BA from a good liberal arts school uh, and a good acting background, a good foundation background, academically at least, um, uh, they need to feel that you um, are marketable because of your look. They need to feel that you are committed and disciplined and focused as an actor um, before they take you on. And not just have a good look and we'll see what happens. And take a couple of workshops. Um, they need to feel that you're really serious that this is your profession. Uh, and even then, they may already have five or ten of you already on their roster. So you need to give them something that they could sell. And uh, ideally, it'd be great if you already had done, as an actor, uh, a short film, a series of short films, an independent film, maybe a webisode series. Even if you're not union, you can do a lot of stuff non-union these days, even in L.A., and build yourself a demo reel. You need to have sales tools like that before you go in and take a meeting with an agent, unless you are 13 years old and um, just starting the business and incredibly precocious and, and great personality and most importantly of all to an agent's lathering chops, they need to know that you have potential. You know what I mean? When you're young. Um, because at the end of the day, by the time you're 27 in this business as an actress, and this is what many agents and managers have told me in that age range, uh, they're not going to sign you at all if you don't have, if you're not already somewhat established out there. Guest stars on television shows, um, movies, something at Sundance. Uh, unless you are, for the most part, unless you have some sort of established career by 27 as a, as a, as a female in this business, really hard to get a decent agent. And maybe a year or two later as a, as a guy. Maybe by 30 if you haven't. It just, it's just the way the business works. It's very young. It's very youth-oriented. Your agents are in their 20s and early 30s as well too so unless you're established for the most part or starting to establish yourself they're not going to touch you so you, you, it's a lot of pressure to sort of have that machine going for yourself early um, and that's why some actors it's tough because I go to these showcases where all, Carnegie Mellon and uh, Harvard ART and, and all the big acting schools the programs <coughs> from all over the, the country come and showcase their MFA actors in LA, in May, that's happening right now, we're getting all the notices. It breaks my heart because some of these MFA students are almost 30. And, and some of them are talented, but they're not marketable so much because they're a little too character -y or they don't quite fit in. So they're really good, and those are the actors who have a more of a struggle, even though they're trained, have a bit of a struggle getting um, uh, traction, or they do a lot of, they go to Broadway, or they do stage work, or they, you know, they do theater, or they try to rough it out in, in California or New York um, and see if they can get some traction um, in film and television. And I'm just talking generally, guys. There's always <coughs> exceptions to that, and it always warms my heart when I see a 33-year-old break out you know, on a TV show, like, where have you been all this time? Right. I've been toiling away in theater and smaller roles, and all of a sudden they got their break. So it, it does happen. But that means they, they are very persistent also, and they don't get discouraged. Or if they get discouraged, they get over it because they realize that, you know, so many people want to do this, and they're one of them. And if, if, if there's a 90% unemployment rate, you know, we've always, we were panicking in this country about a 10% unemployment rate. Well, for actors, it's the opposite. It's 90% unemployment. So you got to be able to just roll with that and be comfortable with that and say, this is your dream. And, but be realistic about it, too, and say, I need to help my agent. I need to get an agent. I need to have tools. I need to have marketing. I need to have um, 
uh, a demo reel. I need to have a reason for them to want to sign me. Because their business is to make 10% of everything I make. Which means that, that, that agents have overhead, right? And an agent actually at a mid-sized agency said, what do you need an actor to make so that you can keep them on your roster? And they said, we need an actor. It costs us $2,400 a year to service every actor, expense-wise, overhead. Which means they need to make $24,000 a year. Most actors don't make $24,000 a year. So they have to be willing to take a, a leap of faith and ride it out for three or four years with you, hoping that you're going to break out. But that's how they think. What's well, really uh, powerful about, about what you are talking about is the fact that, again, comes back to this is a film and television business. It's not a hobby. It's not a fantasy. It's a, a business, and it, and it runs the way any business would run. I mean, there's a creative component to it, but the bottom line comes down to, are you somebody I can make money with? Am I going to make money in this? If I'm not going to make money, it's not worth my time. And everybody has those stakes. Uh, That's right. And the higher up the ladder you go, I mean, when you're talking to develop, developmental agents and managers, of which there are fewer and fewer, um, they're willing to take a risk. You know, on a recent graduate from the program, 22 years old, you know, you're new to L.A., I love your look, I love your passion, you're incredibly talented, I think, you know, and then there's that, there's a reason why managers and agents get into the business at that level, because they're passionate about talent, and same as casting directors are, and we want to give you guys breaks out there. Um, the higher up the ladder you go, though, when you're talking about CDAA or WME or UTA or ICM, the four powerhouse agents, they rarely even look at developmental talent unless they've just done something at Sundance, you know, and they've just broken out or they're just about, they think, to break out. Um, so, so you want to start many times with a smaller agent or manager who is passionate about you, you know, and then unfortunately you leave them. The moment you start, you know what I mean? I mean, that's the biggest lament from young, from uh, smaller agents and managers is the talent always dumps them at right. a certain point. Comes with the territory. And, and, it, and it's fair to say that producers and directors and cinematographers and everybody now has agents and uh, you know some of the same marketing tools that an actor would need, a director, a writer, a producer, cinematographer, gonna, they're going to need an uh, editor, they're going to need reels, they're going to need uh, somebody repping them or you know the, the same business tools uh, to get a job as, as, as an actor or anybody else would to get a job. Exactly right. So yeah, that, that's, that goes across the board. Sorry, I didn't even mention that. I was really uh, actor-focused. But it's the same thing for um, writing, directing, clients. You need an agent um, who can pitch you. Um, if, if you're not in demand, right, and there are not that many that are in demand that have deals set up, and those are the ones who don't need the jobs because they already have the jobs, and they have jobs lined up for the next, you know, they're on a run, they're hot. Uh, for everybody else, the episodic directors, the, the writers that, you know, just got something, a small budget film made, they're the ones that need the agents. Same level of passion, who take the you on because they believe in you, and they think in, at some point you're going to pay off. Uh, because you've got a handful of great scripts that the literary agent loves and says, this guy's brilliant. If I can get him in the room in a production company or a studio or with the right producer, uh, he's a talented writer, he's a talented director, you know, th this is someone I want to I wanna shepherd their career, help them develop their career. Same thing on uh, that end. Other question? I, I see that Ryan has something to say. He has said. Okay, thank you. Yes. I was just wondering because we we were talking about uh, acting and kind of changed my question a little bit. And like for people who kind of are interested in that sort of route, I know you said you started acting, went to casting director. Like, um, I guess what would be kind of your tips if you wanted to 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 do acting, and then is it worth it to specialize or kind of get like 
try on a bunch of different stuff and see if you can get your foot in the door that way. Uh, okay, specialize in as an actor or specialize in, oh, I like, I want to do acting, but I'm also interested in filmmaking. Yeah, like, is it is it worth it to, like, uh, like audition for acting roles and kind of, like, put your your hat into the ring as a grip or, and a sound person and just kind of, like, try and get it, in, or should you pick, like, I want to act, I want to filmmake kind of thing? Uh, I don't think there's any right or wrong answer there. You know, when I when I was an actor and then I moved to LA, I was acting, but I was also a PA on a on a project, a couple of projects, and then I was a location scout for commercials, and then I did some commercial casting. So I was trying to figure out uh, acting is what I could come down to do, but I realized that. I couldn't always work as an actor every day, and I also needed to make it as well, too. So I put myself out there not only to, to try to make some money, but also to gain an understanding of how the other side works. So I, I, don't, I think there's so many people in this business who did some acting when they started and moved on to other areas of the industry, and all the experience they had as an actor certainly gives them a, a perspective of what actors go through. I, and, I, and, yeah. No, no, I, I don't want to interrupt you. Go ahead. Yeah, and, and you can, because that's, that was really my point, is, is, is you can go ahead, and especially in a market where you're not maybe doing, there's not a lot necessarily a huge amount going on, um, you, can do, you can do it all to start out with and see what, what sticks for you. You might feel like, you know what, I like this. I like being on the set. I like, I like, you know, I'm not going uh, to, maybe you like being a grip. Maybe you like a, a being on the a technical side. Maybe you like being on the editing side. Maybe you're writing. You know, you've tried acting. You like it, but you realize how challenging and tough and competitive it is. And maybe it's not entirely for you, but but you should try it, especially if you, where you guys are right now, when you're in that learning and that experiential phase of your life where you may not have to make a decision tomorrow. Um, you can try some stuff out. So um, just be available for that as well. Too. And if you get a shot at it, go for it. See if you like it, you know. And then over time, you know, a mentor of mine said, uh, what do you, you know, you've been doing all this stuff for, four or five years now, what are you really good at? And what do you really like best? And then we sort of, you know, winnowed it down to casting at that point. And then he said, then do casting. And then do it. To put the other stuff aside, focus on what you want to do, let people know that that's what you want to do. And I tell you within one month, I started getting casting work. One month after letting people know that I'm not a dilettante actor, uh, a, a PA, that I'm not doing that anymore, uh, I'm not doing location mat scouting anymore, I am uh, not acting right now, I'm focusing on casting. I got my first job on a series called Tales from the Crypt, you know, when I got back into things. Uh, from a casting point of view, and I, I didn't stop, uh, I didn't stop working at all after that point. So, Excellent. so like, just to kind of sum it up for myself, what you're kind of saying is, like, do, kind of do everything, find out what you're good at and what you like, but you're probably not going to venture very deep until you decide what that thing is. That's right. I mean, you will sort of skim the surface, I think, and get some experience doing a lot of different things. Like an intern in a in a in a in a job, they are they are asked to do a lot of stuff, you know, and then uh, they figure out what is more appealing and attractive, and where they find they just lean more towards creatively or from a business point of view, and then they usually start settling in at some point. And I don't know what you know. There's no particular age or cutoff time, but that's something you're going to have to decide. And then just go for it um, when you've decided what that is. But sure, as much experience as you can get, you know, yeah, I think it's a really good idea. I think it helped me decide. I think um, 
that it's, my opinion on some of this is that the, as with what you were talking about, the more experience you can get, if you want to be a director or a producer, especially uh, in all of the other departments, the, the better equipped you are to understand the tasks ahead of you as a director and producer. The, the more that you can uh, walk a mile in an actor's shoes as a director, if you've been acting, you understand the challenges, the securities, the insecurities, the, the foibles, the upside, the downside of being an actor. Uh, you can learn to speak their language better, communicate with them better, same as in casting. If you've come from an acting background, I think you understand more the pressures of, that an actor may or may not feel inside the audition room. So, you know, it, it literally is the ability to, to, to try on different hats, walk uh, miles in different people's shoes that enrich you and will bring to your overall uh, development and expertise uh, a much fuller understanding of the business and the different components that make it up so that whatever area you ultimately specialize in, uh, you, you, you can collaborate and understand the other areas and work with them that much easier or better. Yeah, there's a good there's a, a book out there that I read. Um, John Badham, the director John Badham, big director in the '80s, '90s, big big movies. Um, John Badham, I think it's B A D H A M. John Badham wrote a book called "I'll Be in My Trailer," and it's his experiences with a list like John Travolta's the the A list actors that he was working with at the time, who would not come out of their trailers because they didn't. They didn't trust the director. And when John Badham was getting started, he didn't really understand the actor's process. So he had lots of difficulties with actors because they're fragile egos and their insecurities, and they're playing just downright not trusting the director's process and not trusting that the director understood how they worked. So they would headbutt. And it, it, it is his war stories. John Badham's war stories of working with actors earlier in his career before he started to get the hang of, of, of what actors need and how to, how to give them what they need to feel safe and the trust level. So you guys, I mean, if you ever get a chance, it's a really fun read. And I, I only heard about it because I worked for him in a movie and then I, I looked him up, you know, because he was a famous director, but... Uh, I looked him up and I went, oh, he, he did this book. And I asked him, he said, yeah, it was not an easy book to write for me because, you know, I, I, um, I learned some big lessons there. But it was, it's a great book to read for emerging filmmakers. Um, I, I want to say from my standpoint as an actor, I want, and, and, and we're not talking name value here, right? I mean, as it, an obscure actor, um, you know, I want to be able to trust the director and put myself in their hands and know that, you know, uh, the decisions that I make or we make together are good for the project and good for the performance and good for the character and good for all these things. And it's really tough, even even at a level of, 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 of non, you know, notoriety, to put yourself in the hands of uh, uh, emerging filmmakers who haven't worked with actors or who haven't cut a, a lot of movies together and who, who aren't students and this primarily, who aren't students of the history of film and who know a good movie from a bad movie, they just picked up a camera and go, I, I want to make a movie. So understanding how delicate that process is, and I, and I had a note, because I wanted, I wanted to ask you about this, and that is Aaron Paul comes in for $50,000, and he does this movie, and he is working with an emerging or a second-time uh, director and producers. What is the expected treatment that this actor should Receive. In other words, some people don't know how to treat incoming guests. And yeah, make sure that craft service table is stocked <laughs> with good stuff. Um, because actors like to eat, you know, and actors need to feel, and the and the, uh, the agents and managers need to uh, insist typically that they are treated um, extremely well on the set. Uh, not deferentially, but that they have everything, you know, they know that it's a bare budget project, but they want to make sure that, you know, their hotel is decent, that, um, that they get per diem, which is a certain amount of money every day, 
it's union mandated um, as well too that they uh, that the conditions are are union conditions on the set uh, that so they're treated well um, that's that's really important and then of course the actor is not going to come on unless he feels that the agent or that the uh, filmmaker himself is someone that he feels strongly about collaborating with and you're right Rex there there are um, actors you mentioned that Clark Gable's house is next door right. well there's a, a an actor that I coached who came to the house here and he's 24 years old and he's an actor and he went to school and he trained and um, um, but not well, yeah, and he didn't know who Clark Gable was. You know, if you're an, a 24-year-old engineer f student from India and don't know who Clark Gable is, you get a pass. <laughs> if you're an actor and you have no idea who Clark Gable was, he, he barely knew who Warren Beatty was, only wow. because I oh, mentioned God. the movie Dick Tracy, and he went, oh, oh, yeah, 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 Dick Tracy, I remember that when I was a kid. So you guys have to, you know, filmmakers tend to be better at it because, you know, they, they tend to be more cerebral as well and they tend to be uh, a little more disciplined when it comes to studying film history and how to make movies. Um, I don't find that when I talk to young film students, they tend to be pretty educated about film much more than I am, about the process of filmmaking, about the equipment in filmmaking, um, and, and they're pretty bright about all of that. But I think it's really important to attract talent that you seem to be educated and uh, creative and passionate and uh, inspiring as a filmmaker for actors. Awesome. Any questions? <clears throat> yes, sir. Is it, <clears throat> Rex brought up uh, auditioning, and I've always found that to be sort of an awkward situation. What are some, uh, I don't know, things you can do to, to break that? That's, that's, that's great. Um, I love that because it looks like you guys are all of the gamut in terms of producing, directing, writing, and acting interest too. Um, well, you take a Paul Weber workshop. I would say um, that would be the first step. But, uh, but the truth is that you guys, you just do it. You just start doing it. And I think it's, it's mostly... Um, the opportunity, the first time you audition, you're going to be nervous, um, especially if you're not prepared, if you don't know how to break down a character, if you haven't read the script, if you haven't really worked on the, the scene that you're supposed to audition with, if you're just flying on instinct, um, if you don't know how to manage fear and rejection. You know, these are the things we talk about in, in class is to empower the actor to feel to get a sense of confidence when they before they walk in the room so that they interview well. Just like you guys outside of the business, if you're gonna go interview for a job, you need to come in knowledgeably, looking good, feeling prepared, confident. Um, uh, otherwise, you're not gonna interview for that job well. It's, it's, it's the same with acting, except now you're expected to also emotionally kind of bear your soul in front of people that you've never met before if you're reading for a role that demands a bit of that. So uh, uh, it's repetition. It's being in a class. It's learning your skill set so that you understand character and how to break down a scene. And then it's coming in with confidence, but um, humility as well, too. Leaving your ego outside leaving as much of your fear and anxieties outside and fueling that nervousness in a way that creates, so that you're on your toes. Like an athlete, before they go into a game, they're gonna be nervous, but they channel that nervousness in a way that helps fuel their performance as well too. So um, it's a process and it's not easy and a lot of actors don't like, uh, I haven't seen this, but Patricia Arquette, who just won the Academy Award um, for Boyhood, talked on a YouTube video, which I'm going to try to watch, about auditioning and said she was a lousy audition. She hates auditioning. Um, uh, and in spite of it, you know, she's done well. But you can't, in spite of it, go into it. You have to be able to try to be as good an auditioner as you are an actor. And that takes time and repetition. Some, act, some people are just better at it than others. Some people learn dialogue quicker than others. But do the homework you need to, to do before you go into the room because 
In smaller markets, you you may only have three or four, two casting directors, one, a couple of them. Right. And if they you come in for them and you don't impress them, and I know we actually talked a little bit about an audition you went on right. recently, and you know how challenging it is that that they're not seeing you in the best light possible, and that sometimes they will you will leave and you will feel like ugh. That's my impression. That's their impression of me is not as strong as I had hoped it would be. And cast directors know everyone has bad days. And I tell the story of Channing Tatum coming in to read for something for me earlier on. And he just wasn't very uh, prepared. I mean, he wasn't the way he wasn't prepared. He just didn't make an impression on me like he has done since. <laughs> since. Um, yeah. uh, but that was early days and lots of actors go through that in casting, they don't always have their best days and cast directors don't always have their best days but the best way to deal with that is to be as prepared as possible which gives you the confidence to go in and uh, walk on water with humility because that's what we want you guys to do you, we want you guys to walk on water give a good performance but we want you to do it with a sense of grace and humility and, and, and ownership in the room not, not, not an ego insecurity. Does that make sense? Yeah, and and I think again, I, I would extrapolate that to every department um, because it's good advice. You know, you may have lots of accolades, and you may have lots of laurels, and you may have accomplished lots, but if you wear it on your shoulder, or you know, on your forehead, uh, you, you you know, people will tolerate you as as long and as far as they can if if you bring them money. But uh, it's much nicer when you can do incredible things and be genuinely nice and open. Again, what Paul talks about is, is the ability to communicate, the ability to get along, the ability to, to deliver what you need to deliver, but, but, but there's other things that are important to it as well, and I, and I appreciate that. And yeah, That's I, a great I, point, Rex. It's so true, guys, that so many people want to do this business on both, any side. You know, they're, they're, you know for, for, from gaffers to grips to electricians make up every element of the business, there are lots of people who want to be on that set. So the humility, the, 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 the working to get along with everybody, genuinely good people, that's who filmmakers want to surround themselves with on their, on their crew. That's why Clint Eastwood and Ron Howard and filmmakers like that use the same people over and over and over again. There's a comfort level there. Um, when an actor comes into audition, and they leave the room, and I go, she was amazing, wasn't she? And the director says, yes, she's a really good actress, but I will never work with her. Because my best friend who directed a project told me she's a nightmare on the set. Her ego, her, her demands, her issues, it's not worth it. I can't afford the time to deal with a diva on the set. You know, I've got to shoot an episode of a TV show. So, and I didn't know that at the time, but it just happened to be the case, and that's happened on a number of occasions, where an actor will leave the room giving a great read, and yet the director or the writer or the producer won't hire them because of their reputation. So reputation precedes. It always precedes. Um, I told them about my, my, my audition. I mean, I didn't go into details, but... But uh, you know, I blew an audition. I, I have a postcard in my car that's being mailed today, and I haven't I haven't addressed the elephant in the room. But I've just said thanks for seeing me, and I hope I get to see you again. So, uh, you know. But anyway, that's really great too. Don't apologize for that. You know, right? Uh, because they get it, they understand that, and they're you know, chances are you'll get another shot, and you'll be able to redeem yourself. And you just want to thank them for um, for seeing you, which I think is a, a a classy thing to do. Well, thank you. And, and um, one of the things that, that I have an advantage of that you have not yet had an advantage to do is that uh, both here in Milwaukee with Paul or in L.A. Uh, at numerous different times, I've been able to sit in on workshops, you know, or, or when he's auditioned people, and, and that in and of itself gives you so much information about watching the performance. I watch him give notes to actors. You get to see... Uh, a number of actors come in, sometimes in his workshops and stuff like that come in and they perform and you're sitting back going I would pick that one and or I wouldn't pick that one for whatever reasons and you, you know and I've been able to talk with Paul and go why did that person impress I mean if you can if, if you move to Hollywood or Chicago or New York or whatever market you move into if you have the opportunity as 
producer, director, writer, actor, to to ask a casting director, can I run your camera or could I be your reader? Um, it's a it's a really valuable educational place to be because you get to watch someone like Paula Professional do what they do when they're interviewing and auditioning actors. Um, yeah, so if you even get a chance locally to, to sit in an audition process or, you know, even when we've done, when I was in Milwaukee with you a couple of years ago, there were a few, I think there were a few director, writer, auditors. Right, right. Who yes. Walked, they wanted to see what our process was so when the time comes for them to audition actors, they get a sense of of how to work with actors because actors are these sensitive, creative creatures that that are not easy to understand sometimes. And and directors and writers are often afraid of them. You know, there are there's a, they don't understand the actor's process. So I've seen producers disconnect or maybe a director just not understand enough of the actor's process and they are there's this natural wall between them because they find them to be these these like little these little cults you know unpredictable emotional uh, 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 babies that need coddling that are that they just don't understand that they they just can't tell them just stand there say the line and say it this way you say that to an actor, that actor would walk off the set, you know, or they'll be so intimidated they'll never get a good performance. Um, you have to figure out a way to, to creatively work with that actor. That's that's why John Badham's book is so interesting, because it 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 show he gives method he gives examples of how to get an actor to do what you want them to do and feel like they're part of the process until instead of just telling them what to do. That's you know, Michael Bay, who's done these huge movies has been known for not as using actors as props. You know, you look at his movie and they all, they do, they're, they're not, no one's going to win an Academy Award for being in a Michael Bay movie. Um, so there are war stories about how Michael Bay treats actors. Uh, if you just understand that, that that's how he works and just go with it, you'll be okay. If, if you're not going to be one of the boys or one of the girls on the set and just buck down and do what he tells you to do, if you're not going to be that and you're an artist... You know, you're going to run into troubles on a John Bay movie, on a Michael Bay movie. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, yes, it'd be great if your director was very actor sensitive, but not many, not a great many of them are. So and, you have to learn how to work with those people, too. And, and probably even more so today, uh, the kind of what we were talking about before, those people who don't understand the history of filmmaking or the history of acting or the art or those who are technical junkies and are interested in only the shot and the camera and the equipment. You know, and capturing that versus capturing story and performance. You know, it's it's really. I mean, when you make a movie, uh, my opinion, one hundred percent my opinion, unless it's an animated special in which you're using voice talent. You know, and even then you're working with people. Unless, but if it were completely computer generated and you didn't have humans involved at all, that's something that is very rare. This is a people business. This is a, a people centric business every it takes hundreds of thousands of people to make a movie so we're, we're never ever not dealing with people and the better you understand people and the better you have a, a an empathy or, or the ability to connect with them and to be able to speak with them and speak with them in meaningful mm -hmm. ways as a director mm -hmm. so that they know what you're asking for and you do it respectfully and th that they can deliver and that you both can win um, th that goes a long way toward propelling you forward in your career in whatever department you're in. But especially since we're talking acting and directing, is it possible to give, we've got about 10 minutes left on the outside and I want you to be able to either wrap it up or see if there are any other questions, but is it possible for you to kind of describe the process of giving a note in, in, a, in an audition or an adjustment or something in a way that would um, be an example for how someone might suggest in a hypothetical case. Uh, yes. Yeah. And this is what I learned from a director when I was an actor. And it was really a clever way of telling an actor that you love what they're doing, but you'd love them to do something different. Okay. Yeah. 
Um, and that's usually what I'll do in the room with an actor who doesn't give me what I want or what I need to see uh, in the audition. I'll usually say, I really like what you did. Now what I'd like you to do is add this or think about, um, think about, uh, I get the anger and I get the hurt. Now let's look for the love in the scene. You know, what's keeping you in the scene? So well, I want you to turn on the vulnerability a little bit. I just don't want to see rage. Although that, what you did was so good. You know what I mean? So I, I try to affirm what they're doing. Um, if I know the actor really well, if I know them personally really well, I'll go, let's take that again. Uh, and I'll say, John, that sucked. <laughs> okay, you need to take a breath. You know, we need to think about a couple of these things. So I'll sometimes shorthand with actors that I know well and have worked with before who, who understand my, my shorthand. And they trust you. I mean, there's they that relationship that, the, that you can say that to them and they're not going to be offended. And they sense it. They already right. know it. I guess, so let's just take this again. And, and this is kind of the direction I need you to go in. Okay, because unfortunately you only have a few minutes in the room with actors and um, uh, you can't teach them acting. And I can't even deal with process in the room. I can only try to get them to results, which is awful. Which is why when I teach a workshop, it's more about telling them, showing them a bit of a process so that they can get to the results. In the room, I need the results right away. I need to deliver that performance as an audition before I send them up to the director. So I have to shorthand everything. But I try to do it in a way that supports the actor, that encourages the actor, that makes them feel like they're on the right track, and if they're not, gently move them onto the right track, rather than make them feel uh, lesser, intimidated, uh, overwhelmed. And for me, in the room, having been an actor in the room, the more anxiety you have, because you feel like you're not giving them what they want, the less you're gonna be able to give them what they want. So that's the same on the set. You know, the more you can make an actor who's very creative and sensitive and, and in the moment and ego, has their own ego and their own insecurities to deal with, as we all do, the more I can make them feel comfortable and as if they are heading in the right direction and then just gently steer them the way that I want them to go in order to get what I need. Um, that's the skill or the empathy that a casting director has to have in the room. And I have to say, a lot have it, and a lot of casting directors don't, because they have their own anxiety to deal with. And, and all, the, all, the, all the actors feel is tension in the room sometimes, because the, the casting directors have so much pressure on them to deliver the actor. And, and for me, I try to take a deep breath, try to keep the temperature in the room, moderate so that so the actor can do the best job he or she can do to deliver what I need. It's very mercenary on my part, you know? It really is. I mean it's if if I can get this actor to do what I want, then I can get this actor to the director and maybe get an actor hired, make my job easier. So it behooves me to try to create as as uh, collaborative an atmosphere in the room as possible. Oh, fantastic. A few minutes left. Any any question or comment that Stephen? I have, um, I have a question. I'd just like to um, thank you for the wonderful, brilliant job on uh, uh, Haunter. Uh, I watched Haunter last night. And, oh. um, I saw that in the beginning your name wasn't in there, but in, at the end it was in the credits with additional casting. Yeah. So I was wondering what role did you play in picking the cast for Haunter as an additional caster? Okay, so... That was a story. This was a Canadian movie by uh, Vincento Natale, who's, who did Splice, a movie that was got some notoriety. Um, so he was a known filmmaker. But it was a Canadian movie with a small budget. I think two and a half million dollar, three million dollar made B budget. So they came to me asking, just like small budget projects come to me and say, can you attach an American name? Because everyone else is Canadian, and not particularly well known, right? So I said, let's, I love the script. 
I think, you know, there's no nudity. It's a really cool role for a 16-year-old girl where she doesn't have to show her boobs, right? You know, it's great, it's great. and it's not a, a typical slasher horror movie. It's a psychological horror movie. So, and I like, the, I like the director and the writer. And I, the producers were prolific. They'd done movies before. So it was a perfect package for me to get behind. because They weren't going to pay me a lot of money to do this. They didn't have a lot, but I loved the project. So I put a session together. Really good actors came in, young actors came in. Um, Canadian actors in Toronto came in. They could make the movie if they had to with a no-name lead actor. That wasn't good enough for me. I, and they said, you know what? You brought in great people. We could probably do this. And I said, guys, I'm not, I know my time with you is done and you've hired me just to put a session together and some names together. And, but I'm going to work above and beyond because I believe you guys deserve a name actor in your movie. And so I said, and that actor is Abigail Breslin. She's not... A, she's not. She was a. An, she's an emerging star. She's got. She's done many, many uh, films before. She's not your typical Hollywood young beauty, and you don't have to be for that role. If you saw the movie, it wasn't necessary. She had no love interest in the movie, right? So I said, Abigail Breslin is perfect for this. Give me two weeks to get a script to her. She's on the set of Ender's Game somewhere in in, uh, in the east. Let me get it. Her, 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 I'm, I'm talking to the agent. I'm pitching your project. Um, you've got great elements. It's a great leading part for young actors. So I, I was able to push the script to the agent, who got it to Abigail, who read it, and then wanted to do the movie. So that's so that's what I was able to deliver there. So did I cast the movie? No, but. Because of getting Abigail Breslin, that movie premiered at South by Southwest the year, last year or the year before. And because of her name, it got a deal at IFC distribution. For, and then, then it, got a, 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 it got distributed and it was shown in movie theaters. So they actually made their money based on Abigail being in the movie. So would I love the front end credit, you know? Uh, instead of last card, additional casting by as almost tacked on. Yeah. In fact, when I saw it, I was just a little bit pissed off at that because I saw it at South by Southwest and I, I saw the credits go by and I went, Jesus, did they not even put me up on, did they not even credit me for this? And then there was sort of a added on, you know, the last, I think, for, toward the end. So, you know, that's kind of the way it goes. But that movie would have never gotten distribution if Abigail hadn't done it. So that's a, thank you for bringing that up. That's a great example of what a casting director will do if they believe strongly enough in the project. Uh, they will make it possible to get the movie made, financed, distributed, and uh, everyone gets paid except me. <laughs> Ouch. Ouch. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. So, have you guys, has this been helpful? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, very helpful. You've been awesome. I absolutely rock, and uh, I appreciate it. Well, let me ask you this, um, just in closing, if there's anything you want to say or anything that you feel that you didn't say that you'd like to say, you've, you've got time to do that. But uh, this has been uh, wonderful. Well, thanks, and I just want to thank you because, you know, you're one of these guys who just is so passionate and always in the game, and I know you love to come out to L.A., and this is where your real passion is out here as much as you can be. But obviously, you know, you've got a life where you are in family. And, and, but I've always been impressed with your, your uh, increasing your passion, your knowledge about the industry as well, too. And that you are always looking to learn more and develop and grow more, just like all of you guys are. Uh, and I think the more knowledge you have, uh, especially for you young filmmakers, uh, when you come to L.A., when that time comes, you're just going to have a lot more tools in your, in your tool chest. Um, and, and, and that's uh, always a good thing. But I also want to encourage you guys to make as much hay as you can in your own neighborhood, you know, in your own backyard. You guys are learning to develop relationships with each other. Your filmmakers will be surrounding yourself with people who are like-minded creatives who 
who will be making small budget films together. You don't have to rush out to LA right away. Just like I tell actors, develop as much as you can in your own backyard. Then when you're ready, come to Los Angeles. And at some point you're gonna to want to if you're really serious about this business, but you know, keep learning and growing. And that's one of the reasons I like to travel and teach and work with um, uh, individ- uh, filmmakers all over the country to help them develop their, their, their skills and their passion, whether they're actors or directing or producing uh, students, so that when they do come to LA, they make our lives, so hopefully they'll wanna hire me to work with them. Um, because, oh yeah, when I was a student, I met Paul Weber, or he was out here, and uh, now I finally have a budget, and uh, every cast director wants to work with uh, promising directors. Because we want to ride your coattails when you finally make it. You know what I mean? So we're investing in you guys as well. That's awesome. That is. So anyway, thanks for, for having me. No, it's awesome. I'm going to give you a call from the car in a little while and uh, just to, to debrief. But uh, it's been fabulous. I, I appreciate everything. And, um, and, and this has been very useful. Uh, Paul, you're also on Facebook. There's Paul Weber Casting on Facebook. Yeah, there's a there's a Paul Weber casting group page on Facebook. Um, if you guys are, you can. Uh, I look at it once in a while. I post something on there, but it usually tends to be a form for everybody else yeah. to put their stuff on, hoping that I'll see it or each other will see it. It's perfectly fine. You know, I've got. Um, uh, I'm on Twitter. I'm uh, at Paul Weber CD. I I tweet. Just occasionally, I have probably as many followers. I think I have 350 followers, which is, I think, what Jesus had when he first started. <laughs> you know, so maybe I'm on to something there. Maybe it'll grow. But, you know, I, you have to work media. And I'm, I'm, um, I don't work it as much as probably I should. Um, and I'm not proud of that. But for me, I just try to do the work, and the rest seems to follow. But um, for you guys and, and anyone who's in their early 20s or whatever, you guys are born with new media. You know, you're born with iPhones right out of the womb. So take advantage of that. You know, I, I tell actors and everybody, unless you make a little noise, you know, you're not going to get heard. But just make sure the noise is, is, is noise that you are proud of getting heard and it's not going to burst eardrums. You know what I mean? Um, so take advantage of, of social media out there too, because it's the way people are uh, raising financing for their movies too. Awesome. And you have a website because you do do workshops around the country, around the world. So what? Yeah, I, I, I do, and there's some nice information in, on on the website too for actors um, uh, to just learn about our process, where I came from, and and there's a. For actors, there's a drop down that sends you to a email address. That if you guys have questions, especially the acting students, if they have questions uh, regarding acting, they can always send me an email as well too. Yeah. And uh, the website is allwebercasting.com. All right, fabulous! Thanks. Thank you so much. You bet. So I'll talk to you on the phone, and then you know maybe in the next year or so we'll 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 be out there again too. And I certainly encourage any of you guys to to audit a class if you want to. Uh, sit in on the classes. Well. I'd love to. I'd love to try and work it out for the fall, and uh, and I'm, I'm supposed to be back in LA soon, so uh, we'll we'll meet up here or there, or there or here, Great. or on okay, Skype. So Thank you. Your, your sweet bambinos too, you know. The kids. Oh yeah, I'll say hi to the kids. I'd be happy uh, to hear from you. Yep. Oh, good guys. Well, thanks so much, and and. Uh, Thank you. I see somebody waving back there. It's good. Look, two people waving. Three. Oh, my God. Four. Everyone's waving. Um, and uh, have a great rest of your class and, and day, and then we'll catch up later, Max. Okay? Thank you kindly. All the best. All right, Bye-bye. See you later.